Okay, thank you. Hi, everyone. It's really nice to see you all. And I've just realized that uh, actually my um, my presentation is a bit more of a mixed bag than just low nutrient substrate. So but uh, I'll go through all the all the things I'm going to go through. And then afterwards, obviously, if we want to focus in on a few of those things, then we can do that maybe in the chat and the questions afterwards. Okay, I'm just going to try and share my screen. Okay, can everyone see that? Yeah, okay, cool. Um, yeah, so I'm going to, I guess, uh, I should really have focused specifically on what um, Peter told me to do, but I'm going to kind of just run through all the the various things in and around this subject and, and in my head and within, I guess, within landscape architecture and within public space that, um, uh, that, that I get very excited and very, either very annoyed, very optimistic, uh, are very frustrated with, I guess. So I'm going to put those all out there and then we'll have a chance to focus in on what you guys want to talk about um, at the end. Um, so there's going to be some optimism and there's going to be some uh, annoyance, I guess, as we run through this thing. Okay, so just quickly before uh, everything, I guess, that uh, we talk about within landscape architecture and within public space, it all, at the end of the day, always depends on, on, on maintenance or stewardship or caring. I don't know, you know, it, it's gone out of fashion now, maintenance as a term. I know I should be using something slightly softer now. But anyway, you get the gist. Um, everything depends on this. Um, but the problem, I think, at the moment, and certainly the problem that's been that nags our industry and, and and quite a lot else in society is the where out where we spend our money. So we spend our money mostly up front, don't we? So we've always got money to, um, we've always got money to uh, build infrastructure generally, uh, but we've never got any money to look after it. Um, and this this is this picture on the right just about sums it up. Uh, and I'm sure these guys are very nice, um, uh, but uh, they've spent all their budget on their three handled spade. Uh, rather than probably the tree they're putting in and certainly rather than someone to come and water the tree, I would guess. Um, and that just the, that 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 kind of runs through uh, the, the system that we work on. It's all the money tends to go up front. We get the picture with the stainless steel spade uh, and then we all bugger off. And um, uh, and then, then what, what does it matter afterwards? Um, so I'd say maintenance absolutely key to everything we're going to talk about. And And as Peter said, we looked after a social housing estate in East London for 18 years. Uh, and basically all the good things we did on that estate weren't in our maintenance contract. So all the things that made any difference, that made people happy, that actually had a had an influence, I'd suggest, on the place, weren't in the maintenance contract. So they were all the talking to people, for instance, number one, talking to residents, stopping talking, taking the ear protection off, uh, which again is another, is another, I mean, again, I'm talking about social housing, green space, which is poorly funded, but... On the whole, our maintenance contract required us to wear that stuff all the time. We didn't really have anything other, any other jobs that didn't require that. Um, but what we essentially, if we can take these things off for long enough, then we can talk to people and we can maintain the place. We can uh, we can subtly change the place to suit the people that live there. I and to be fair, that should be the job. That should be in the maintenance contract. So this picture to me sums up what good grounds maintenance is all about. So this doesn't have any plants in it, but it does have Zainat, one of our coolest residents in it, who's baking bread in her community garden on the estate. And the reason she's doing that, to be, I, I would guess, is because we gave her space to grow food. We actually listened to what she wanted and we amended and we just changed very slightly how we looked after the place to give her room to grow food and then when she was growing food and she was comfortable in the space she then baked bread in the space and that to me that is quality grounds maintenance and it's got nothing to do with with uh it hasn't got a plant in it and it's certainly got nothing to do with uh wear and ear protection and this hunt this whole kind of front loaded uh system that we're on extends out to design as well so this is a this is a, a landscape in hull uh, which is from where my wife is from. So I have a very soft spot for this place, but this is a big new scheme along the river. Um, and um, I don't know what you think, but um, there's a lot of granite going on. So a lot, huge amounts of money being spent on, um, uh, uh, on hard landscaping on granite. And if you look on the right, the frame, 
the irony of the frame made of granite being bigger than the dirt inside it is is just about sums things up. I mean, it's a, it's a soulless, completely soulless place. And in my head, anyway, I don't know. I, I I think quite simply most of the time, and in my head, it feels like that's a multi-million pound scheme. I don't know how many millions have been spent on granite. I'd suggest a lot of millions. It's come a huge distance, huge energy, huge carbon. Uh, and if we could just remove, I don't know, let's say a third of that granite, which would I'd say would be very much possible, save the, the the hundreds of thousands of pounds that that's made, that that's saved, put dirt in that space and then employ gardeners. And if you put dirt and gardeners back into that space, I would suggest you would want to sit on that bench. As it is at the moment, You why would you want to sit on that bench? Um, so I, I think the whole system would be fantastic. It would be a total game changer if we could move resources into looking after places because that would free up more soft landscaping it would free up people being in the community and of course gardeners in the community embedded in our cities working are much more than gardeners they can become community workers they can become friends they can become all those other wonderful things that gardeners can become but we've got to invest in them so invest in people i'd suggest uh, and this is another example of the same thing so this is a essex wildlife trust uh, visitor center that we worked or well, we didn't work on the visitor center um so they spent two million pounds on on this you know a piece of modernist architecture don't get me wrong i love that kind of stuff in a lot of ways but no softness no niches for wildlife at all uh, and two million pounds and then for the car park uh, and the surrounding landscape they asked us to do all that it was a 150 car car park they asked us to work in that and we had a forty thousand pound budget so that that's the irony of this whole thing, this kind of weirdness of spending all the money on hard infrastructure and not on people and and uh, and, and soft landscaping. Okay, I've got I've got that off my chest. Um, what I'm I guess been fascinated by uh, certainly in the last I don't know eight ten years is this. There's a movement. There's a there's a whole there's a couple of things going on in my head. There's the rewilding thing, uh, which. Uh, you know, makes uh, perfect sense and, and an understanding of what the landscape was like before we came along and under, understanding what the landscape of life was like when it was absolutely pristine, huge biodiversity. Uh, and it's that understanding, I think, that's key to, to rewilding. And obviously, if you're going to rewild a place, um, you're going to have to manage the animals. So there's n it's not a hands off thing, as you, I'm sure you all know. It's very much a hands on thing, managing livestock. Unfortunately, in urban places, in urban areas where we, I guess a lot of us work, uh, we can't have uh, herds of bison and we can't have beavers, sadly, although they are creeping into cities now. So we have to become, I'd suggest, that cornerstone species. We have to take over from what the animals were doing and keep that in our head when we're designing. And I'm also suggesting that what we've done in the last, I don't know, especially in the last 30, 40 years, is remove any elements, that, that element of chaos. And, and it was it was chaos, wasn't it, that drove biodiversity in the past. It was chaos that that that, that uh, bison and beavers and wild boar, all those things, it was that chaos they brought to the landscape that drove biodiversity. Uh, and I think there's a relative, there's a certain optimism in the fact that um, some of this chaos we can we can reinvent with some of our uh, some of our materials. Now, I'm not suggesting, obviously, that we fly tip, but this particular fly tip, local to us, um, is a rather good one, I would suggest. It's a rather beautiful one because it has incredible complexity to it as a landscape, doesn't it? It has topography. It has a myriad of different soils. It has incredible amount of niches uh, and habitats. It has damp areas. It has dry areas at the top. It has that whole wonderful complexity of landscape. And we're trying our best to get this left for long enough for us to get our entomologists and ecologists to look at this over the next two or three years. And I would pretty much guarantee that is going to become more biodiverse than the surrounding area because of its complexity, because of its wonderful diversity. And, I, and I'm also suggesting that, that wildlife actually, in, in, in some areas, does actually much prefer our detritus and our uh, materials. I mean... This is a, the, the hinge off my wife's uh, uh, petrol cap. Uh, it's got a pot of wasps nesting in it. The, 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 the roofing felt on the left-hand side is what ecologists used to actually survey for amphibians and reptiles, don't they? Because those things prefer our stuff. 
So we shouldn't be afraid of our man-made waste. As well. uh, a lot of what we produce and a lot of what we leave is actually good for wildlife. We just need to design it properly, I'd suggest. But urban rewilding, if you want to call it that, that kind of idea of taking the, the ideas of, of, of rewilding in general and applying them to an urban setting is definitely not don't do anything. Uh, and this is a classic example of a what the council did to us on our housing estate where they rolled up, stuck a sud scheme in, um, stuck a load of top, top sicky topsoil on it, and then come and told me they were going to rewild it in a very excited way and a very middle-class white way. We're going to rewild it. We're going to do nothing. And that's what's really good for biodiversity. And look at us. We're very, we're, we're really cool. Well, this is utter, utter disgusting rubbish. This is just a piece of, um, you know, Canadian flea vein, bramble, nettle, coarse grass, some biodiversity potential, but the whole of Hackney is full of this vegetation. And more importantly, an utter arrogance to, to impose this on uh, the, the residency on my estate. Um, and uh, I did ask the guy from the council who was, who was recommending this where he lived. And of course, he doesn't live in the poor part of Hackney. He lives in the wealthy part of Hackney. And they would never do this in a wealthy place. Um, and it doesn't deliver biodiversity. It just delivers a bit more biomass because there's tons of that vegetation there already. So I think we need to just get away from that. Urban rewilding requires a lot of work and maintenance, I would suggest, by us to make it work, to make it complicated and keep it complicated. So in essence, gardens, gardeners, we, we do this kind of rewilding stuff already, don't we? Like, you know, I mean, we, we, we root all in effect, don't we, when we're weeding, we do that kind of stuff. Um, that's why gardens are generally quite good. And some of the places on in the country that are pristine gold standard for uh, biodiversity, you know, like Salisbury Plain, Triple S eyesight, it's only it's only actually uh, good. Or one of the big reasons it's good is because they drive tanks across it. And I would suggest this is a really lovely, optimistic thing. It means that we can be within our landscape, disturbing our landscape, actually being involved in our landscape and can still be a good thing. The other thing I think we're missing out of our landscape in a in a major way is uh, uh, dead stuff. So um, when we um, we have a, a good uh, a great friend uh, James uh, um, who who's an entomologist and works with us, and um, when he came to us where we where we live where we trial stuff, he told us we didn't have enough dead stuff. We added dead stuff, twenty five percent increase in dead wood species, as you might expect. But we can add this this dead wood stuff. We can add it in a beautiful way. We can do a beautiful dead hedge. We can we can add standing dead. We can we can bring standing dead in. Unfortunately, we didn't have enough trees that were dying in our place, so we brought in dead trees and we planted them in the right place. We made them part of the landscape. And I think this is there's huge potential with new landscapes to actually introduce dead material, but do it in a very designed way. So this is James. Uh, and this is the guy that we kind of rely on. This is the guy that we take the cue from all the time. So he's a, an incredible entomologist. And what he does when he comes into a landscape, he will walk into your landscape and he will tell you from, from, from the insect population, from the, from the invertebrate population, he will be able to tell you what your habitat is like, what parts, what, what structural elements of your habitat you've got missing. Uh, and exactly what he did at our place. And then we changed the habits, changed the landscape to fill those gaps. And then he's recorded what's happened since. And it's incredibly important, I'd say, to embed entomologists into design, if we possibly can. Uh, another area, another joyous area for me, and another area that's overlooked, I think, is this kind of misconception, again, that nature reserves are places that you, you don't go in, and they are much better if you don't go in them and you keep people out of them. And we've got to get away from this. So this is a fantastic community garden that, that, that re, uh, volunteers campaigned for to get into a nature reserve right up the road from me. There was a lot of resistance against it because it was, you know, in, in a nature reserve and they thought it was going to be detrimental. Um, they uh, they took out some uh, hawthorn scrub. They left some of the biggest and best trees and then they embedded 20 to 30 different groups of people, families and gardeners to make gardens. Uh, and as soon as they did that, number one, it became a beautiful, beautiful place and a place that makes your heart sing. Number two, it increased the biodiversity incredibly because you'd injected 30 to 20 to 30 
people's tastes. All those different tastes were embedded in that landscape, making it an incredibly complicated and diverse landscape, full of biodiversity. So we mustn't be afraid of that. And I think we, there's great opportunities also for architects. I mean, I think architects are going to have to really step up now and we're going to have to say, yeah, you, you, you know, design the buildings for, for people. Obviously, you've been doing that for a long while. That's great. And, 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 uh, and a beautiful job you're, job you're doing too. But the other thing, we've got to design nature back into our architecture, back into our cities, back into the infrastructure. And I'm not talking about just slapping a bird box or a swift box on the side of a building. I'm talking about designing in niches and habitat at the start with the architect, with an entomologist. There's incredible opportunities to embed structure and niches within buildings subtly and beautifully within buildings and i would suggest we, we definitely need to do that so we need to make everything work harder um, this is some of the cycle shows for instance we do so and i mean cycle cycling i would say is one of those things that we should celebrate shouldn't we we should be saying to cyclists thank you cyclists you know for coming for bringing a bike here's a really nice place to put your bike here's a free coffee here's here's you know you are the most important people uh, and so we can get cycle shelters to do habitat on the side, plants on the roof. We can get it to do more than one thing. And this is a recent project with uh, with uh, bird hides. Now, bird hides, I don't know about you guys, but this is a sort of standard bird hide. It makes you feel miserable even when you look at it. And certainly when you open the door to it, it's going to make you feel even more miserable and intimidated, probably. Um, we don't need boxes like this. We, you know, we need exciting uh, places for people to come. So when we were asked to replace this bird hide, because it had been burnt down for the third time, uh, we built something bright. We took the doors off. We made it a, a, a potential habitat for starters, not a sterile box. So it's got, it's got a green roof on it, lots of habitat. And we designed it for everyone other than bird watchers. So in other words, we designed it for people, families and kids people that wouldn't generally go into um, bird hides. It's still fine for bird watchers. Do you know what I mean? And having a door on the back, no problem. Bright color, no problem. Um, so I think we need to load of this stuff would be cool to rethink. So then now I'm eventually got to the to some of the low, low fertility stuff that we do. So this is um, some of the, uh, the low fertility gardens that we do. And um, this is using uh, construction waste and sand, so inert materials. Uh, now, I'm not suggesting, and I'd like to get that pretty clear, I'm in no way suggesting that, that people go into their beautifully topsoil garden, rip it all out and chuck a load of rubble back in. That's not what we're saying. I think the opportunity is when there's new developments, highways, when there's any substantial development, the soils tend to be, the topsoil tends to be moved off to one side during construction. You've got loads of great machinery. That's the time to decide, do we want to bring topsoil back and blanket everywhere in the same soil topic, which, which really drives the same vegetation. Uh, and I'm saying at that stage, we, we can have a choice. We can, we can use some of the materials on site, uh, some of the construction waste on site. We can, we can decide not to put topsoil back in some places. We can, beef up topsoil in other places we can we can dictate the vegetation and the habitat by where we put the soils coming so it's, it's a fantastic opportunity i would suggest and when you use construction waste and inert subsoils you are you have a completely weed free start to your landscape and then you can direct sow. and if you direct so again i would suggest way the most sustainable way to create a landscape surely one tiny packet of seed in comparison to the huge amounts of pots compost and all the other transport that you get uh, otherwise but the problem is normally on top soil that's very difficult to do but on inert materials and and construction materials it's very easy to do so all the landscapes that we've done including this one all from seed so i guess the the, the brownfield element really runs along again runs alongside of that because it's 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 mimicking really what our landscape would have been like because it's a chaotic place, isn't it? A post-industrial place is a chaotic place. It's full of different materials and topography and structure. It's incredibly uh, complicated. Uh, and, it's, and, and it's mimicking in effect what huge herds of animals would have done to the landscape. It's, it's mixing up the landscape. It's, it's so important. And this is a place down near me. This is Canvey Wick. Um, and this, is, um, uh, uh, this has been abandoned in the 1970s. Um, and within 50 years, it's the most one of the most biodiverse places in the UK for invertebrates. That's within 50 years. And that's just 
abandoning it. This is and this is this is you know in comparison to ancient woodland and all those other things, it's incredibly important place, and it's happened within fifty years. So surely, with the climate crisis, oak mosaic design, this sort of landscape should be priority for us because this delivers biodiversity incredibly quickly. And imagine how good that would have been if we'd have designed it in the first place rather than just left it. So I'm suggesting we design Brownfield. We take the elements of Brownfield that we know are important and that work, and we embed them into new design. This is our place where we've tried to um, start to do that. So as soon as we made the, our landscape more complicated, as soon as we had, we we're on clay, as soon as we brought sand and construction waste in, which was a contrasting landscape, a contrasting habitat, we immediately boosted, for instance, our bee and uh, species from 60 to 120 in five years. Only because, simply because we had enough flowers, but we'd never had anything anywhere for things to nest because they wanted sand. So just that small transition of changing the landscape, changing the soil type, bringing in dead material. Well, just those small changes make quite a big difference to the biodiversity. Because, uh, for, for instance, we, we had plenty of white bryony. We love white, white bryony. It's a great plant. Um, but we'd never had the bryony bee. And the only reason we didn't have the bryony bee, because it has to nest in uh, in, in sunny sand, sunny free drainings and so on. We didn't have any of that. We brought the sand in, just tiny piles of sand like this. Immediately, we got the briony bee. That's the joy of these, um, the, these kind of small changes to the way you look after a landscape. And topography is the other thing. You know, they, I mean, land, brown fields are full of topography. They're full of tipped material. So we've been messing around and trialing lots of ideas with trenches and mounds and all those other things then there's incredible opportunity i would suggest with just a simple trench so with this one for instance we're, we're putting phragmites into it's a 800 millimeter deep trench it's in heavy clay and we're hoping and assuming that the phragmites won't spread outside the trench so we'll be able to then dictate where this plant stays and then we'll be able to get it into urban design with anything like and there's other things you can do. I mean, you can you can stack logs in these trenches so they stay wet at the bottom, dry at the top. There's all sorts of interesting things you can do as soon as you alter the topography, I would suggest. And just quickly to dip into horticulture in general, um, direct sowing, incredibly important, unbelievably uh, uh, incredible less energy uh, and, and inputs. Next best, I would suggest, is bare root plants. And I think this is going to happen within our industry. I, in fact, I, I, certainly I hope it will. And I, and I don't know if any of you guys have uh, come across Peter Korn, but um, he uses bare, a lot of bare root planting in public planting. This is him going to a huge public planting scheme. This is him going there in his people carrier with 25,000 plants in his car. Now that equates to 12 lorries of, of trolleys and pots and compost huge difference if you start if we start looking at this uh, and i think within horticulture we're going to have to start doing that soon so i'd suggest all that all the landscapes that we talk about depend on gardeners well, that's for sure and um construction waste and inert soils have huge potential i would suggest within um uh, new developments and landscapes and i'm sorry i must have run over peter i apologize John, thank you so much for that. Um, as ever, there's a massive amount in there to provoke thoughts and questions. Um, just looking at the uh, just looking at the chat, nobody's posted any questions in there. So I'm going to leap in. And I'm going to ask you to um, to just expand upon uh, the the things that you were talking about in terms of um, um, bare root stock um, planting direct into into sand. I've seen some of you, some of your um, rants on on LinkedIn. Could you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah. So, uh, I I think the 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 kind of subsoil sands and and construction waste they they as I say they they give you a contrasting uh, landscape. They they uh, they they they're incredibly important for the diversity of invertebrates. I would suggest if you mix up the sands and the topography. And the other thing they do as a gardener, they give you an inert material to start. So you start off weed free. That gives you a really good chance to establish your landscape quickly. It also means that the, the, the aggressive weeds that we all know and love um, have le less chance to establish. And even if they do establish, they're much slower growing. So you have much more time to maintain them. 
So it does give you a really good chance to actually create a, a, a very diverse plant community uh, quite quickly. And I would suggest because the fertility is lower, you're going to have much more chance to keep that diversity of plant material um, with relatively reasonable maintenance. Um, and I think that's one of the, the wonderful things it, it does. And uh, and I think it's it overwhelmingly for me, it's about the contrast of, of, of soils and topography and materials in a, in a landscape that drive biodiversity. But I think we do, do need to do it in a beautiful way in an urban context. You know, we can't just tip a load of rubble or we can't just tip a, a you know, tipping a pile of sand is one thing. But in, in the urban schemes we do, we, we, we encase sand, for instance, in perforated steel rings. So we get that kind of consistent, we, 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 we sort of give a, a, nod, a nod to the sand, make sure the sand's there for people, but get people to understand that this is a neat thing. This is something we mean, meant to do. Um, and I think, I guess what we've been doing is taking what a load of people, have, like people like Richard Scott and loads of other people, this, this message is not new, is it? And I'm sure you, all of you guys are, are watching this know this stuff anyway. I think we've probably just taken it from a, a purely ecological and conservation sort of area and we tried to move it into an aesthetic and into a design space. I think that's the, probably what we've done because what we're saying is not new. People knew this stuff. I think we've just tidied it up maybe and, and given it more of an aesthetic. In the same way as we've taken a, a pile of pallets as, a, as, a, as a, an insect hotel, let's say, and, and we've um, CNC machined reclaimed tropical hardwood in the most precise and beautiful way and drilled it for bees the bees don't care whether they're going in a pile of pallets or they're going into a beautiful um uh, very carefully designed post they don't care but we definitely care so i think that's what we've been trying to do is to move move the conservation and again give it give it an aesthetic and, it, and i think some of the wildlife trust and i i'd su suggest that uh, a lot of those places have missed the importance of the aesthetic, especially around visitor centers and all the places, because most people don't go that far from a visitor center, do they? So that's the most important place. Make that beautiful. Spend your money there. Spend your money on the car park. Spend your money where people are, you know what I mean, on those places. And, and uh, I think that's something that some of the conservation organizations have missed, is that aesthetic alongside the wildlife valley. John, we've got a question from from Rachel in, in the chat. Uh, Rachel, I wonder if you could turn on your, your camera and microphone uh, and ask John that question about capital versus revenue. Yeah, so um, I'm married to a gardener and I know how it feels, how few gardening jobs there are. And um, I, I work delivering um, local places for nature capital scheme. So I'm kind of investing in a lot of railway sleepers and, yeah, fetching in topsoil. I, I feel like I'm getting this wrong. Part of the purpose is to create nature on people's doorsteps to enable them to connect with it. But if I don't have the revenue to be able to do the community engagement, I'm imposing in the way that you described earlier. And it worries me a great deal. There's this, this, this theory, people um, step out into this nature space that we've plonked on them and and suddenly connect with it care about it fight for it and I, I don't see that it works that way around the revenue is so important but I don't understand how we can go about changing that that culture bringing about that shift how, how we do it you mean uh, the, the shift of it uh, of, of uh putting the importance a bit more on the ongoing care of these places yeah, should, yeah. When you describe you know, I, how gardeners become community development workers, yeah, you know, I, I, you really I see that could... happening in places where they've got the money to do that. But I have to ask people to put in a five-year maintenance plan. Yeah. But I can't offer them any any kind of support. No, I agree. I agree. Well, that's that's. I guess we're both saying the same thing. I just think somehow we've got to get this 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 conversation going in our industry and within our funding, uh, within our funders, and we're we're desperate to make this happen. We've we've got a we're um we're we're contemplating using Chelsea, for instance, as a as a stepping stone to kick this conversation off and get a we 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 we're, 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 we're going to have a go at, with any like getting a show garden at Chelsea, but not putting a garden in. We just get a show garden and we put gardeners in the garden and we just talk about that. Now I know that's going to be tricky and it might take the, my best skills of persuasion, but I mean I think we just need to have because I really think honestly that when I, all those years we were working in social housing. 
the, the things that you, you don't need, and this is not an arrogance. You, I don't think the people on our estate needed huge, sophisticated, core 10 steel clad design. They actually wanted more people on their estate just caring for it and changing it subtly to suit them. That doesn't need massive, important, famous designers to do that. That just needs reasonable quality gardeners to do that. And, and, and somehow, if we can change, we've got enough money, haven't we? Because I could always get money on my estate to build stuff, always get money to build stuff. But I could never get money to actually shift to uh, looking after it. If we could somehow move that um, the emphasis onto that, I honestly think it would be a total game changer. I mean, I was at a conference not long back where they were talking about garden and I, I can't remember, I think it might've been Bridgewater or one of those, it was 32 million pounds anyway, was involved somewhere. 32 million quid. I mean, if you imagine if they gave us a million pound out of that, we could employ two new gardeners on every social housing estate in London for 10 years, right? Well, imagine the impact that would have in comparison to a 32nd of one garden. So I think it's, it's, not easy and it's going to be difficult but if we could do it i i, I it would it would really because uh, because it, it, it affects all of us doesn't it whether we if you're a designer there's nothing worse than going back to your scheme and seeing it in a in a mess um but i think people underestimate the value of embedding people and gardeners are good people to embed i'd suggest into a landscape into a housing estate uh, and then see what happens because they do way more than gardening once they've given, if they're given the chance anyway, you know. John, thank you so much for that. We're just running out of time for this bit of the um, the webinar, but in the last couple of minutes, I wonder if you could answer um, uh, Marie Martin's question. Marie, um, would you like to ask, ask your question, turn on your microphone and the camera? Hello, John. Hi, Marie. Sorry, I don't have a camera function. Um, no worries. But my my question is in terms of herbicide use within maintenance regimes and how you see that fits into your low nutrients um, species and kind of bringing in co um, communities that may be willing in person, but um, just like in terms of an ethos. Uh, well, I, I, actually, herbicide use is, is quite an interesting one, for, interesting for us because we we had a, a, a huge amount of pavement, as you can imagine, on on our estate. And to be fair, one of the biggest complaints we 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 ever got, one of the main complaints we got, is if we did if we left the pavements uh, in a mess. So we had a, quite a conundrum with the herbicide thing. Um, I mean, the, 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 we found what we did was we cut down on we 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 eliminated the herbicide from places like the edge of railings around lampposts all those places you know where they herbicide where they can't get a mower to them we mm -hmm. we we use those places and we we first of all we didn't use um we just sowed those areas with wildflower mixes and then we maintained them and that was i guess one of the most successful things we ever did and that's why our, the estate was eventually named the poppy estate simply on the back of us we replaced the herbicide on the edges with with flowers but that took gardeners to make that work as you probably all know you can't just dump a few flower seeds down and walk away so um that was one of the most important things we still we we had a real problem uh, taking the herbicide use away from the main pavements um we reduced it reduced it but it was very hard because the the residents and there was a lot of there was huge amounts of there's quite an amazing mixture of cultures and and uh, ethnic groups on our estate and the cleanness and the tidiness of the pavement outside where they live was a big deal to them 